Hello everybody, welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com. You can find cool stuff in stock every day. And check out our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. And check out our altar sleeve, support the show by using the code MAGICMIKES at checkout for 5% off anything in the store. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, MTG Nerd Girl. Hey guys. Ruben Bressler. Good afternoon. Yeah. What's up? Well, it's time to talk about Cons Block, which was a fantastic time in Magic. I really enjoyed it. Uh, this was a set that came out when I was right basically in the middle of working at uh, Star City Games. And we had this was also where the key art was used as one of the first creature collection things that we did at the time, which was a thing. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to bring up just a little bit about the set before we started talking about it. For those who don't know, Cons of Tarkir originally came out September 26, 2014. Um, featuring the mechanics of Morph, Prowess, Delve, Outlast, Ferocious, and Raid, um, and was followed later by the Fate or Forge that we're talking about, that it's not letting me click on it because I hate you. Um, but regardless, uh, this kind of that's sort of the time period we're talking about. So we're in the 2014 days, the Halcyon, seven years ago. But nice. let's still talk about yeah, some of that. So there, was, there were uh, some huge keywords that not only returned but got their start in cons of tarkir block um you know obviously morph was a huge thing uh but prowess kind of took center stage during cons block mm. and there were um a number of uh, interesting things that happened during cons and it's often looked upon and we talked about this last week as like a heyday of draft yeah um it's a lot of people's favorite draft format I mean, yeah, they, this was two of our, I mean, it made two spots on my list last time. And then it was like two of our number ones as well, I think, for last week for Limited. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty, uh, I mean, it's it was just a wild, fun, fun format for sure. Yeah, the um, the sets themselves, they had a really interesting way of releasing these, which is you had Kanza Tarkir, which was a big set. You had Fate Forge, which was a small set that was released on January 23rd. 2015 and then later you had dragons of tarkir which was released on march 27 2015 and they had that thing where you were supposed to draft them independently there was cons plus fate reforged fate reforged plus dragons they had hybrid mana to help put the sets kind of together and whatnot yeah. super weird and unique and cool and this was also the first time we got to really see the uh the wedges instead of the shards let's see the wedges which were the cons That's right that said, we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who is the most eloquent in letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our, well, I'm sorry, which format we did not choose as one of our top 10 draft formats. Ruben? Well, I mean, I couldn't not pick Ryan Murphy's comment. Ryan sent us a message on Facebook, actually, mm. um, and I loved I loved the input. Uh, regarding top 10 draft formats, I'm sure nostalgia and small sample size play are coloring my opinion, but one of the dra best drafts I ever had was actually fourth edition. Mm. Sets were designed for draft. Draft wasn't a widely known format, and FNM wasn't really a thing yet. Still, my local bookstore did a draft of fourth edition. It was a first for most everyone at the table, and as a freshman in high school, I didn't lose a game, thanks to the combination of Shiv and Dragon and a Millstone. You always remember your first. <laughs> That's super cute. Yeah. Fourth edition was the set that had come out as like, you know, back in the day, they didn't give you a core set every year. So that was the core set <clears throat> when I entered sort of magic. So I got to look back on uh, revised and see those like really ugly dual lands. And I'm like, God, those things are hideous. Who would want those ugly things with, with the crazy pattern in the text box and stuff? I didn't like that stuff. I liked fourth edition. Fourth edition <laughs> was cool for me. And I got to see a lot of what magic sort of had to present in these cards. These are some of the first cards I ever got to see in magic. I don't think i ever drafted it drafting didn't really show up to me until like mirage visions almost um but there was definitely packs cracked that i bought of fourth edition and was let down many times uh life lace was a rare like it was bad sure but the set and all you know it was good clean magic and it was uh it was terrific yeah, I mean, it's a, it, there were some interesting things happening in the set, and you could tell that Magic was evolving in terms of what Magic cards should and reasonably could do. 
Um, you know, it was, it was nowhere near where we are now, but I mean, I remember drafting fifth edition and fifth edition is still, I believe to this day, the biggest set ever in magic and fifth edition was not a fun draft experience. Yeah. Fourth being a little bit smaller, you know, you want to have, you want to end up seeing some of the same stuff. You want to have a little bit of, uh, uh, repeatability. You don't want every deck to have one copy of things. You know what I mean? Right. And so it was, a, it was an interesting time. Um, and it had, it had some interesting, uh, things happening. In it, so like at the time, a bit before my time, right? Because so I, I have no, I have minimal <clears throat> input. Yeah. As the, as the boomer, as they would say, I can fill in here, which is the big talk at the card shop at the time was they were pissed off because they couldn't use the revised lands. They could only use the pain lands that were in ice age. That was the only dual land you had anymore in standard uh, balance was restricted to a one of, they put balance in standard land tax was restricted. They have the freaking strip mines in this set, which was also kind of insane. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> between, you know, the rack and winter orb and stuff like that, there were some griefy stuff going on and, oh, sure. but all in all, it was, it was sweet. This was, this was the halcyon, I, I assure you. Uh, that said, <clears throat> thank you to uh, Ryan Murphy for being a part of the show. Please contact us on social media for your prize. Thanks again to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring this giveaway and stay tuned for our top 10 list this week. And maybe you can win next week's free gift certificate because it's time to talk about our top 10 Cosbot cards as we were describing. This set was sweet, but let's go ahead, or this block rather was sweet. So let's go ahead and get started with our number 10. Ruben, what's number 10? Uh, I ended last week's uh, post show of the Patreon post show saying what card I was going to start with in this list. Mm. Uh, and I stuck to that. My number 10 is Secret Plans. Nice. Um, okay. Secret Plans is a green and a blue uncommon from Cons of Tarkir. Reprinted again in Commander 2019 and Time Spiral Remastered. Face down creatures you control get plus 0 plus 1. And whenever a permanent you control is turned face up, draw a card. I was obsessed with the the comes into play tapped land and every morph I can get my hold on, hands on archetype. So anytime I could get a secret plans or a trail of mystery first pick, uh, that's all I wanted to be doing with my life. Um... Uh, I think that there was a side event draft at Cafe Mox at GP Seattle where I got to first pick, first pack of secret plans and I never looked back. That was my most recent experience with cons block draft and it's everything I've ever wanted to be doing with my life. It was uh, that that that's one of those terrific, you know, signpost uncommons of like, what does green and blue do in the set? Well, part of green and blue is a lot of morphs. And so morphing all the time, you're mighty more. Sure. Super I mean, morphing. you might be playing it in a green and blue deck. I was still playing it with ponyback brigades. Mm. So <laughs> all the, colors. you know, I, no one knew what was underneath. It could even be a boat. Nobody knew what was in my, in my, in my box. So, wow. That, that is an interesting one. That is also the nice thing about morphs too, is that it, like you could uh, be a little bit greedier in your colors and then, just wait until you get the mana to flip them so they're still like something. It made splashable, morphs were a little bit more splashable than they might be normally. So it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so moving on here to uh, my number 10. This card was cool. This this card snuck up on me personally because when I uh, when I go through the cards and go through the sets and whatnot, I like to take a look at them in different ways and to look at them whether, you know, sort of sorted by their highest price, whether it's USDs or by highest price, whether it's Magic Online, because sometimes Magic Online can have weird things that happen. And when I support, and when I sorted all these three sets by EDH rec, this, this card shot to the top. This card is a, Three and a half plus dollar uncommon, and I did not see this coming. So I felt like it was worth mentioning how important Teamer Sabretooth is to oh. casual formats. It's apparently a Wild. big thing. Teamer Sabretooth is two green, two generic mana for a 4-3 uncommon cat. But it has a very special ability of a green and a generic mana colon. You may return another creature you control to its owner's hand. If you do, Teamer Sabretooth gains indestructible until end of turn. Mm. So it's nice that it gains indestructible, but really you pay two mana to return something to your hand. So now you can replay it and soon the combos right. go nuts. So Teamer Sabretooth does a whole lot, but not really what it's supposed to do if that makes uh -huh. sense, which is kind of cool and weird and neat in and all in and of itself. 
in limited, yeah. it's meant to be like a good like outlet for you to be an aggressive player. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe in constructed, it's like this cute, more like ETB uh, enabler, which is pretty sweet. But yeah. um, I remember that card from limited. I had no idea it was like a thing in constructed in any way. That's awesome. Me neither. I was like, holy cow, really? <laughs> That's a three and a half dollar card? But like, if you think about like, what is the easiest and or cheapest way you can pick up one of your creatures? I think it's one of the cheapest. And you can go get it with Green Sun Zenith or Finale of Devastation. There's a number of things that you want to right. uh, combo alongside of it. Um, you, it. It goes really well with the when this comes into play, untap uh, cards, mm -hmm. things like Village Bell Ringer or Hydrax Tower Scout or Hyrax Tower Scout. Um, I'm seeing a lot of Voyaging Seder to untap Gaia's Cradle mm. uh, with these combos here. Uh, basically, any creature that can uh, add more than one green mana to your mana pool. Mm. Voyaging Seder Gaia's Cradle, Karametra's Acolyte is another one that I'm seeing on, on the combos here. Uh, not to mention other colors. Dockside Extortionist says hi. That's obviously infinite mana. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge combo piece on a solid creature that can be tutored. Dockside so, Extortionist is 60 plus dollars? Yeah, man. Best red card ever printed for EDH. Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay, well, that's my Jesus Christ EDH cards are how expensive moment. Let's yep. move on here to uh, the number top 10 for Nerd Girl. What you got? So my top 10s, I wanted to, I have a little bit of a mix of cards, things that I found very fun to build around some of my, my favorite standard decks. But I also like wanted to give some credit to cards that, uh, you know, had some sort of lasting impact on various formats. So um this one is something that was pretty fun and limited, got you some sneak wins, and uh, and and still is played as a, a one of in, in a lot of decks. Well, only one deck really, but uh, it's pretty sweet. It's become immense. Ooh. This is, I think, the only uncommon on my list. It is a six mana instant speed pump spell with delve, so it costs one less for each card that you remove out of your graveyard. And uh, your creature gets plus six, plus six. So this is a pretty big one of in all of the Infect decks still to this day. Uh, it was kind of a silly way to, to kill people in Limited at the time. So just overall, I feel like this is kind of a, kind of a card that when I think of the set, this kind of stands out and it still has some sort of lasting effect in, in current magic, so. I mean, Delve is like many, you know, cost saving mechanics or whatever, super mm -hmm. dangerous, like super scary. And somehow it's based on the format. So sometimes you have to ban cards that are okay in standard, but they're not okay in legacy or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, dig through times of the world. But uh, yeah, Become Immense, this was one of those cards that, you know, like, like a lot of Delve cards, honestly, I was like, oh my God, that seems really pushed because... It, when when it's like your graveyard and you don't really care, it's just, at that point, it's just chaff. You're like, okay, I got four guards in my graveyard. This is a two-mana spell. Like, that's awesome. And this thing can kill you out of nowhere. And it yeah. usually did. Limited. Not the last time that we'll talk about Delve mm. uh, in our cons block cards. Um, but Become Immense in particular, I did play a one-of in, like, the red-green Atarka's Command aggro deck. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, as well, uh, just because plus six, plus six is good enough. But for sure, in fact is where this is uh now you know, where it's bread is buttered these Dell, days. probably not our last showing on the list but uh outlast i would argue is on none of the lists mm. just throwing that out there oh i thought you were segueing into your outlast no, never mind. absolutely that not. would have been incredible it? it's not we'll go to uh our number nine ruben what's number nine Ineok Bondkin. No, I'm kidding. Sorry, Outlast. <laughs> we're not. We're not. That's that's the one card with Outlast I could think of. Nice. Um, Abzan Falconer. That's Abzan the one I was Outlast. gonna say. I yeah. liked that yeah. one in Limited. It was good. Yeah, it's a good one. And I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, Outlast. It's unfortunate. Uh, my my number nine has Delve. Um, <laughs> my number nine is uh, Banned in Modern, Banned in Legacy, and Restricted in Vintage. Uh, my number nine is Dig Through Time. Yeah. Uh, dig through time, six colors, blue, blue, instant. We aren't paying that ever because it has delve. Uh, look at the top seven cards of your library, put two of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Obviously, this card was a superpower in modern and legacy where fetch lands exist and, and small cantrips like brainstorm. Um, it, it's just a spectacularly powerful card. 
uh, and and still played a lot in Commander as well, where, you know, small piddly effects, you build them up and you're allowed to play stuff like Mystical Tutor in that format as well. And then you just find the things you want later in the game. And it's uh, it's a, just a very powerful card selection spell. Yeah, this was my, this was famously, you know, when you, when you make a lot of content about going through every card in a set and then Brad Nelson decides to pie bet you over whether this card is good or not. And I said, yes, I will take that pie bet. I think this card is bananas. And he couldn't see the delve for the trees. And before you know it, I was slamming a pie in Brad Nelson's face over it, which was pretty awesome at the time. Uh, yeah, this card is sweet. It's still legal in Pioneer. Because when you live in a world without Fetchlands, no fetch it's totally fair, which is insane in and of itself. But that's what you get for being a Fetchland, Fetchlands. I mean, a lot of these Delve cards were were fine in Standard. Yeah. I mean, you look look at Standard with De Dig Through Time. It was a good card, right. but yeah. it wasn't backbreaking. We weren't casting it on turn three right. um, like we were in, in Legacy and Vintage. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Nerd Girl, what's number nine? Uh, so my number nine is a card that I found to be very fun in Standard at the time, and also uh, one of my favorite cards to play with in Limited. It's a bit hard to cast, but it is Mantis Rider. Ooh. It is a 3-3 three, three Flying Vigilance and Haste for three mana, but it's hard to cast. It's blue, red, white, um, and that's it. It just has like a bunch of keywords. It's a pretty big beater. I had a pre-release where I had two of them. Ooh. And Sick. there were games where I just like would play it on turn three, play it on turn five, and then they could just never win the game. It was pretty crazy. And uh, I also like what it brought to standard. Like it was a pretty fun deck without it being super controly. It kind of made uh, a more aggressive, there's a little bit of variety for a more aggressive deck that you didn't typically see when you were just only looking at like, you know, mono reds and the prowesses and things. So it was pretty neat. Nice. I um I now Lightning Angel was one more generic mana that had one more toughness, and that showed back up in Time Spiral. I didn't actually get to play with Lightning Angel the first time around. It came out in Invasion, I think it was Invasion. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. So I didn't get well, Invasion Block. So uh so this time I got to play with it. Anyway, it did. It's it saw play back in the day during Time Spiral Standard. Mm -hmm. Lightning For Angel sure. was a good card, so it was. Sweet. There was an extended control deck that played it. Yeah, that still played it. So. Plenty of room to, to, to sort of pedigree, I guess, to have for Manus Rider. And sure enough, it saw lots of play during its time in Standard. It was great. And nowadays, uh, look at that creature type there. It's the only Mantis that's a human. Uh, it does see play as like the main, one of the big main finishers. It's evasive. It has haste. Put it into play with Ether Vial or your unclaimed territories. Mm. It's very easy to get going in, uh, in modern. Yeah, and it is bananas. Well... Another card that I, this is another one I was like, I can't, really? Like, this is the, this is worth how much money? It's a, it, this is just a really weird common? This is a $4 common. Why is there a $4 common in Dragons of Tarkir? Well, it's called Impact Tremors, and they just made a, oh, a yeah. animated D&D &D version of it for a secret layer. Impact Tremors is dope and what it does is very simple for red and generic mana it's a common enchantment it says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control it deals one damage to each opponent so when you have multiple opponents when you have lots of loops when you're using the teamer saber tooth uh, thing to, to pick up stuff and put it back down well you'll kill people out of nowhere and that's why it's a freaking six dollar secret lair card now Jeez, who knew this is uh i mean you have very popular commanders in Nor in the Wary, Krenko Mob Boss, mm. Perforos, um, other token producers um, like uh, the Locust God, mm. Krenko uh, Tin Street Mob Boss, Tin yep. Street Hooligan. Um, you know, all of those kind of, uh, and anything that makes tokens uh, is, is going to want impact tremors. And it's able to take out an entire table at the same time. So it's even even more ridiculous yeah it's it's kill you out of nowhere type of card but man i was just i i wouldn't expect a four dollar common it just it comes and gets you yeah. all right let's move on here to our number eight ruben what you got first hire first hire on my list is at number eight oh, and no. i'm not surprised uh my first hire is number eight as well nerd girl you got one 
Mine is also higher. Oh no, Ooh. our first ever. This happens. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Our first ever missing of the number, it, it, it does occur. So Ooh. I will say there is a lot of really, really strong cards. Like as I was combing back through all three sets, I was just like, man, these are some all stars. Probably more in this block than than most. It's yeah, a I, was, lot. I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, Wizards win a lot of different places here. Ruben, what's number seven? Uh, my number seven is another Commander All-Star, and it hasn't really seen much play anywhere else, but it is a very, very, very popular removal spell in Commander. And unlike Impact Tremors, which kind of requires you to build your deck around it, um, it in order for it to be useful, right. uh, this card is just it just goes in decks. Uh, my number seven is Reality Shift. Mm-hmm. Reality Shift is an uncommon originally from Fate Reforged. Uh, it's been reprinted a couple of times. Colorless in a blue instant. Exile target creature. Its controller manifests the top card of their library, which means that they put it onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature. Uh, manifest is a hell of an ability. It, and, and this card in particular, like I am, I, I'm, they, I think they reprinted it enough to where it's basically affordable because I remember at the time I'm like, this common has, this has to be like one of the top tier uncommons. This is a blue spell that exiles any creature and gives them a two, two. And if it's a creature, they can turn it and face up if they want to. But most of the time, 40% of the time, it's not going to be. So this card was super sweet and limited. I loved it. I don't think it actually saw a ton of constructed play, not as much as I felt it warranted, honestly, for what it did. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean, it was. it's very good in Commander when Commanders are a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, any Anytime you're able to take care of a god, uh, you know, anything that's indestructible, it's a huge deal, and this is super cheap. So, like, the, 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 requi- the deck building requirement for it is not very high. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. All right, so moving here to my number seven, which I enjoyed. This card, like, when I read it, I was like, oh, my God, this card's great. And then I read it again. I was like, wow, this card's really incredible. And then later on, it got to be one of the all-stars of Standard. Today, worth, like, 83 cents. But for, like, a period of time, you couldn't find a cheap Whisperwood Elemental anywhere this card was a monster for two green and three generic mana it's a four four mythic elemental at the beginning of your end step you manifest the top card of your library we just talked about that putting the card face down as a two two and you can turn it face up for its mana cost if it's a creature and you sacrifice whisperwood elemental colon until end of turn face up non-token creatures you control gain quote when this creature dies and manifest the top card of your library so everything that wasn't a token was going to be replaced with a two two when they tried to wrath your board and my god it could just get completely out of hand and ridiculous and the mirrors with this thing were ridiculous and damn it's it's a hell of a match card that's all i'm saying it was a lot of fun this was actually supposed to be on my list this is the one huh. where i had an accidental duplicate and then couldn't remember what the card was that was missing so yes huh. this card it was a ton of fun and standard mm-hmm. it was insane and limited it was just an all-around awesome card for the set and i felt like it did a lot for what green was trying to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it was a blast to play with, that's for sure. It was weird to like read and hear people going like, I don't think that card is very good. Like that card's not gonna make any impact. And I'm just like, I'm like, I was like losing my mind how much value this thing gives you yeah. at the beginning of your end step. So you get six power, six toughness over five mana immediately. Oh my God. Yeah, I love this card a lot. And Wrath Protection. It was a big piece of the uh, the green-white manifest Master of the Unseen decks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just a very, very powerful card. Yep. Nerd Girl, what's your number seven? Higher. Oh, no. More mm-hmm. hires. Well, we're going to keep on trucking then. Moving on here to our number six. Ruben, what you got? Hey, y'all. It's another Delve card. Mm-hmm. It's another blue Delve card that is banned in Modern and Legacy, restricted in Vintage, also banned in Popper because it's Treasure Cruise. Yeah, it is. Treasure Cruise, seven colorless and a blue for a sorcery with Delve. Draw three cards. You remember when this was legal in Legacy? You were able to play four of these in Legacy for about ten minutes. You remember that That's first not... weekend? It was just It was so ridiculous. bad. It was horrendous. Oh my god. You, you just there, I mean, in a format that's already all about fetch lands and brainstorms, now you get to play four ancestral recalls mm-hmm. effectively. 
so many Delver decks that weekend. I don't think I'd ever seen so many in my life. They just, they came out of the woodwork because you just gave them Ancestral Recall. And yeah, that card ran over everything. But was surprisingly okay in, in Limited. It, it was fine. It was. It was. This is my number eight as well for just being like a very iconic card. Mm. Yeah, this was like when you played it limited, it was like four or five mana most of the time, if as I recall. Oh, yeah. And that was fine. fine. You know, every once in a while you get it real cheap. But at that point, you know, you're top deck also, anyway. The, so the cards you're drawing in limited are are not good. Like, mm-hmm. It's a land and two crappy creatures. Right. Not force of the will. The cards a bolt. you're drawing in legacy. <laughs> yeah. The creature, the cards you're drawing in legacy are a force of will, a bolt and a delver. Yeah. Yeah. Or a fetch land, a brainstorm and a, and a, a chain lightning. Like it's yeah, this card was unreasonable. Yeah. So speaking of not being necessarily reasonable, my number six was a fantastic creature that I really enjoyed the design of, and I like it a lot. And wizards, uh, if I recall this correctly, they kind of did it again, sort of sometimes. But I really like the idea that you can have a very sort of strong control card, but you got to put the shields down if you really want to be able to use it. So Dragon Lord of Jutai was a fantastic creature. It was so cool because you could tap out and play it in your control deck and you felt okay about it because by the time you were going to swing in with it, then you had spells to, to help protect it and make things happen or, or untap it or whatever because as you will see, Dragon Lord of Jutai is a blue, a white, and three generic mana for a 5-4 mythic legendary elder dragon has flying and it has hex proof as long as it's untapped which i just love and when it deals combat damage to a player you look at the top three cards of your library you put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order that's what yeah. you do card was great yeah. card was the main dragon in esper dragons i mean it had other dragons in it but this was the dragon that you played with your silumgar's scorns and your foul mouth invocation i think was the name of the card <laughs> sounds about right um and there were a couple of other dragony kind of cards uh and it's a dragon so nice they printed it twice they they printed Iam iamrith iamrith the desert doom yeah uh recently uh, and it's very similar uh to iamrith um uh from the adventures in the forgotten oh, right Rose. it just has ward of four is that right while it has Ward 4 as long as it's untapped, and when it deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Then if you have fewer than three in your hand, you draw cards equal to the difference. Mm. It's a 5-5 five, five instead of a 5-4, mm-hmm. and it still costs five mana. Very similar card. Um, if we had a Silumgar Scorn to go along with it, I think it would be seeing more play. Nice. All right. Then. Yeah, I don't think I've seen the, the newer one in Standard, but the the one here in the cons block was... In quite a few decks, it was definitely a lot of fun to play with. Um, drafting it was was kind of nuts as well. Yeah, this yeah. card was a bomb for sure. And yeah. you played it, and you were suddenly in Jeskai, and that was okay with you because, my God, it's a dragon. Yeah. Nurgirl, turn number six. My third in a row higher. Oh, wow. going for a record here. I'll tell you what. Let's move on here to number f- five. Um, Nurgirl, do you have a number five? I do. Awesome. I have a five and a four. Woo, we there did we it. Go. We did we, it, everybody. Yeah. But, but I, I know Ruben said he had four hires as well, so I'm guessing... That... I only have two hires. I have oh, two hires. Oh, Evan, then. I and had then two same. I had a higher and two same. So, between... so I'm wondering if we just did this thing where we just switched... Maybe. ...the orders. It's possible. Yeah. That said, what's your number five? Um, my number five. So the next two are probably... Uh, slightly biased to this. They, they just happen to be my favorite standard deck of all time that I like pretty much enjoyed playing the most. You guys know I'm not a huge constructed fan, but like I really enjoyed uh, when this set was in standard. So now my number five is Den Protector. Nice. That which was my eight. is uh, another one of the morph cards. It is, so you, you know, you can flip it upside down for two mana and then it costs uh a colorless and a green to flip up uh creatures with power less than den protector's power uh can't block it and then also when den protector is turned faced up from being morphed uh target uh return target card from your graveyard to your hand right so it was an eternal witness and the the megamorph thing really megamorph i really i still hate that name all the way till today seven years or whatever six years later i seriously hate that name 
Um, but Megamorph for like a green and generic mana, if you, when you flipped it up and it got a counter on it, so it was a three, two that no, nothing with the, no, no two power or less could block it. So it couldn't really be traded for something small. Um, so it was hard to block if you put any sort of uh, equipment on it or gave some sort of boost to it. It was like basically unblockable at that point. So it had both the eternal witness half and also the hard to block half of things. And this was a super sweet rare. I love this card card's insane yeah this card i mean it it is just value attached but being unable to be blocked by two twos and two ones was a huge deal in that format especially with all the manifest running around mm. you weren't mm-hmm. just running into manifest tokens all the time when you wanted to actually get in for damage right. uh and also she does a protect uh this is like the one of the very few cards that has a baby on it it's like this and marwin the nurturer are are the the nursery uh cards very few babbies on on the super card. few baddies that's right all right then yeah that was my number eight as mentioned because that card was sweet ruben what's number five uh my number five we're just gonna keep naming cards that are like restricted in vintage uh in a <laughs> row uh <laughs> they did that a lot in this set my number five is monastery mentor mm-hmm Two colorless and a white gets you a 2-2 human monk with prowess, which is when you cast a non-creature spell, this creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. But you also get a 1-1 monk creature token that also has prowess every time you cast a non-creature spell. Um, I believe that the token that we did for Magic Mike's when uh, the set like review the time spiral the came out. Yeah, the set review token for me was the 1-1 one, one monk. Right. Um, and uh, this is the only thing that makes it. And it was, I think that this was the first creature, not sorry, the first non-artifact creature ever restricted in vintage. Um, just an absurd combo with all of those vintage you know free spells moxes all that kind of stuff yeah this card is just a a monster powerhouse and weirdly just you know again this is one of those what you 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 know the most powerful format of all time we'll play one but you can play four everywhere else it's like that's their format it's full of ridiculous crap at cheap prices and that's what this card rewards you for so high five also briefly saw some play in miracles mm. uh before top got banned in legacy as an aggro kind of end the game option in those decks where you could cycle a couple of tops get a bunch of tokens attack for like 15 mm. um but just a solid creature yeah. outside of vintage where it's busted well speaking of a solid creature that everyone seems to love this is a at these days, a Commander All-Star. This card is almost 10 bucks by itself, and when Whisperwood Elemental is $0.86, cents, and this card is almost $10, you can tell who won in the Commander Wars. And this card was, was super sweet and did see some play, as I recall, saw plenty of play uh, back in the day, which was Sadisi Undead Vizier. That is a two black, three generic mana, four, six rare legendary zombie Naga with death touch and exploit. When this creature enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. So when it exploits a creature, you may search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So it's sack for demonic tutor and turns out sacking a creature for demonic tutor is awesome. And that's where we're at. It's better in a format that's singleton and a hundred cards. Uh, yeah, and it's also enormous. And it's a legend, I mean, so, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. It's like, it's a 4-6. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is ridiculously gigantic. Uh, exploit is a really cool ability. I, I, I really enjoy the gameplay of exploit. Uh, you don't see it a ton these days. Um, does doesn't have a ton of legs in older formats. I have a copy of Profaner of the Dead in my Arcades deck, um, which is, like, a, a way to bounce a bunch of my opponent's creatures, uh, another Naga wizard. But I just really think that the gameplay of exploit is super interesting of sacrificing a creature to get an additional spell like effect. Yeah. I mean, uh, Nurgle, how was that in, in limited? The exploit. It was good in limited. And I remember seeing a fair amount of play in standard too. Um, oh, I just meant the exploit mechanic in general. So how did you feel oh, about that? Sorry. Uh, so Exploit in limited is, I, I think, not quite as good just because you it's a little bit harder to find the synergies for it. Like sacrificing something is is oftentimes a little bit harder to to have access to just because you a lot of times your creatures are are good quality or you don't have enough of them or whatever. But it was still like a fine option to have. It wasn't something that I like actively sought after 
uh, a ton of, but yeah, it was good. Yeah, there was there was a there was still a cost, you know, of yeah. Yeah. even if it's your worst creature, it's still a creature that you had on your board. There weren't as many good like token creation strategies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it was tougher to get the super value out of exploit in limited. Um, but yeah, hmm. you have to have a good combination of like things worth sacking and then also good things to get which it's like a lot of times if you're sacking a you know a four out of ten to get your like five out of ten like that ends up being a lot more time and resources invested that you really can't like afford to do yeah right at that point you're just like i think i'll just take the four six death toucher mm-hmm. for five right. mana be okay with that seems good definitely let's move into our number four nerd girl which number four So my number four goes hand in hand with my last choice. This is uh, one of my, again, you know, centerpieces for my favorite all-time standard deck. And it's actually one of the few cards I still have a play set of because it just goes in my little two by two binder because I like it so much. That's Deathmiss Raptor. Uh, It can be played face up, but it also has Megamorph, but it is a colorless green green. It's a 3-3 death-touching dinosaur beast. When, uh, whenever a permanent is turned face up, you may return Deathmiss Raptor from your graveyard to the battlefield, not to your hand, uh, face up or face down. And then uh, it itself has Megamorph, so it gets plus one, plus one, can become a four, four, and trigger to help bring back your other Deathmiss Raptors. So the reason I like this card is because it gave the green, more aggressive slash mid-range decks some extra card advantage that they often lack. Green doesn't draw cards very well. They don't, um, you know, handle board wipes very well, but this kind of gives them the mechanic that they need to get back in the game uh, if it goes too long. And I thought that was really good. It's funny to me that this is like, (laughs) it's it's a 62 cent mythic because it's literally designed to be played with more copies of itself in a format where you can't play with more copies of itself. The Megamorph of, of five mana, it was a green and four generic mana to turn it face up. Sounds like a lot, but when you were returning multiples of them, that was just felt ridiculous. Like mm-hmm. just getting one back felt like, you know, yeah. you broke something. And at the time, a lot of people were just like, I don't know if this card's any good. I'm like, are you out of your mind? This card is amazing. And sure enough, yeah. it was. It it was great in in standard. And a lot of times you're not flipping this. I mean, I was more likely to flip the den protectors Mm -hmm. to get something else back to then put my Deathmiss Raptors back into play face up. So like Mm -hmm. they weren't the main target for the Megamorph, but Mm -hmm. it was a good option if you were like on top deck mode and you wanted to get them back. I forgot it was just a permanent turn face up. My God, this card Mm -hmm. was ridiculous. So the Deathmiss, the the den protector gets you something else and then boop, 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 bring back all your little dudes and yay. You would basically put four den protectors four death Mr. raptors in a deck and then your mid and late game would be done because you could cycle den protectors one den protector would die you'd return it return your death Mist raptor or two yep. then later in the game get three back then later in the game get four back and you just have 15 mana even when they wrath you like it was wild you would you would destroy 13 creatures then they would play a morph unmorph it get a two death mist raptors and just have nine power the turn after you raft it was wild <laughs> take that I control see, okay you with your mid range green actually this was actually a really fun gameplay it, so it was, I, it was I, don't, amazing. I don't hate it yeah. it was until you played the mirror and you wanted to jump out of a window because right. or god there's a million tokens or well there's a million you, manifests all over the I was thing. gonna say if you i don't know if there's footage out there, there is definitely this, footage it's that grand there was prix a mi- there was a Grand Prix where Green White Manifest was the best. Grand deck. Prix Miami uh, or something, I think it was. Uh, I think it was and, in Florida. And it it was Master of the Unseen, yes. uh, uh, the four four we talked about, yep. the the uh, Whisper. Wasn't that with Brad Nelson and his brother? Something. Didn't wasn't that Corey Ballmeister? Too, I mean, I think everybody was playing that deck. I I specifically remember Sam Black playing that deck. Sure. And I looked at that and was like, Sam Black is playing a Green White deck. Hmm. Hmm. Something is, <laughs> something's terribly wrong. Yeah, so check out Grand Prix Miami 2015, the finals, and Ugh. my God, it gets ridiculous. That thing lasted, God, it lasted like an hour and a half or something. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. It's very long. Uh, the video is an hour and 46 minutes, so enjoy that f- finale. Um, right. Ruben, what's number four? 
My number four is the last hire on somebody else's list. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool, too. That means I get to talk about my number four, which uh, got all new, brand new notoriety. We weren't even prepared for this. They somehow, and, and I think this is the only time there has been plagiarism in Magic that I can oh. remember... And that's on the new version for the Strixhaven Mystical Archive version of Crux of Fate. Now, Crux of Fate was also very important for a lot of reasons. Because you got to remember at this point in time, Damnation had came. Damnation had went. And we hadn't seen anything close to Damnation until Crux of Fate, which felt super duper powerful at the time. And did see plenty of play at the time. Because it was cool. Because then you could play your dragons and not kill your dragons. So Crux of Fate was super sweet. Not, I mean, I'm a little pissed. I had to craft a mythic wild card for this stupid thing so I could play it in my, in my, you know, <laughs> my historic brawl decks or whatever. It's fine. I don't care. I mean, you know, I, I crafted a rare for a lightning bolt for God's sake. Uh, but Crux of Fate is two black, three generic mana. It's a mythic sorcery these days. It used to be a rare. Anyway, it says choose one, destroy all dragon creatures or destroy all non dragon creatures. Very cool. This was the first card they showed us from Fate Reforged, and it told the story that they wanted to tell, which was, in this direction on the timeline, there are no dragons. In this direction on the timeline, there be dragons. And it told it in a very clean, simple way, but also in a way that was shocking. I remember seeing this card and being like, I can't believe that they wrote those sentences. Like, that's a wild thing to do on on a wrath and the cards are super well balanced still still great uh but it, it's a perfect it's kind of a perfect magic card this was the you know the battle between ugin and nicol bolas coming to a head or whatever um and again if things had been different then this card would have been different that's how it is i was really sad about the plagiarism thing yeah wow. it sucks this was um God, God bless. I don't know if we'll ever see another Jason Felix card ever again. And it sucks because he was a talented artist and it sucks that his weird excuse slash explanation was he didn't have time to which you say, aren't you a professional? Don't you know you would never want someone else to copy and paste your stuff as their own? Like none of, yeah. none of it made any sense to me at the time. And it's really unfortunate. Um, and it's coincidentally the only artwork from Strixhaven Mystical Archive they did not make a playmat out of for mm. obvious reasons. So yeah, that's the thing. Definitely makes sense. Who knew? All right. We want here to number three. I share my number three with somebody. That'd be with me. And that'd be with Ruben. Let's talk about it. This card is bananas and I love it so very much. And now I get to play with it these days on arena, which makes me even happier. Yeah, uh, our number three is Colligan's Command. Yeah. Uh, Colligan's Command is uh, a, from a cycle of uh, com the command cycle from Khan's uh, from Dragons of Tarkir, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, named after, of course, the Dragon Lord Colligan. Mm -hmm. Colorless Black Red gets you an instant with Choose Two. Return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Target player discards a card. Destroy target artifact or deal two damage to any target. Yeah, this was the resurrection of the commands that had originally started in Lorwyn, which gave you two options of, well, four. And so now it's like, well, these are a little bit cheaper. So these are kind of the cheap version of still giving you four different effects. They're not huge effects, but added up, added together, doing just the right thing. Sometimes you destroy an artifact. Sometimes you need to shock. Sometimes you want to discard a card during their draw step, which was very important, which you could do with this instant speed discard is incredibly rare in magic uh you know and sometimes it just does what you need something in an eot shock you you know get back my best guy in my graveyard right sometimes that's all you need this was my number seven nice. one of my one of my hires uh this one is is great i think this and a tarka's command were the two i think i liked a mm -hmm. tarka's command a lot more at the time and standard mm -hmm. and i think colgan's command left a uh, a deeper impact in more eternal formats both great. Uh, definitely a big, big fan of this card. 
still a fifteen dollar yeah, card. Jesus. Yes. Yeah, to this day, because it goes so good with Snapcaster Mage, uh, Dark Confidant. I mean, it's it's the card. It's kind of a go to card for Jund when Jund is good. Yeah. Um, it is just clean value. Um, and when you want to stay low to the ground and and get your two for ones, this is a two for one every single time you cast it, even if it's three mana. It's good enough. I'll take it. Nerd Girl, what's number three? My last of four hires. Oh my god, the hire train is so vicious this week. Unbelievable. There's a lot of good cards that are like, yeah. this set was just nuts. Set so it doesn't surprise me. Bananas, as we move on. So of all the cards of three sets, number three happened to be the exact same as Ruben. So my number two is also the exact same as somebody's. Mine? Yours? Oh my god, look look at the synergy. Look at what's going on here. <laughs> number two with Ruben. Or I'm sorry, number three with Ruben. Number two with Nerd Girl. Let me tell you, this card was ridiculous. And it was, like, it kind of had to be. You know what I mean? If this card wasn't good, if this card wasn't, oh my god, like, overwhelming. This card didn't, like, sort of show you the possibilities of what a sick planeswalker could be. They would have failed. And sure enough, they got there. Nerd Girl, what's what's our number two? Our number two is Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Yeah. Ugin the Spirit Dragon is an eight generic mana mythic legendary planeswalker Ugin. It comes into play with seven loyalty counters. Plus two, it deals three damage to any target. Minus X, it exiles each permanent uh, with converted mana cost X or less. That's one or more colors. And for minus ten, you gain seven life. You draw seven cards, then put up to seven permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Now, as we speak... This was reprinted in Corset 2021. I would argue, I don't know about mistakes, the right word, but maybe they could have just not because this card does a lot and kind of, uh, ruins not the word, but my God, it, it kind of makes things a little boring when you often feel that like every single Brawl deck, for example, that has any sort of mana acceleration has Ugin in it. It just does. That's just how the world works. And so I like playing with powerful cards, but damn this is a powerful card <laughs> it is and you know now that they reprinted it on a rip for arena like there's so many games where it's like well i need to win by turn seven or eight and if i don't game over and to me that doesn't necessarily make for great magic interaction or great games but right. like the card is sweet so i can't the really card is blame them for printing it or for people wanting to play with it but i don't know if it makes for the best magic in general the card is undeniably dope. Uh, this was my number eight. Nice. Because <clears throat> uh, it costs eight. Uh, that's what I, that's what I did. saw what you did there. Um, and the card is, is super sweet and is just such a weird case of, like, in so many different ways, it's a corner case scenario. Right. Because it's, it's specifically referenced on cards like Haven of the Spirit Dragon. Um, because it is the spirit dragon. It's a, it's a gigantic colorless planeswalker. That was the first time we'd ever seen that. Um, no, I think this was we, after Karn, right? So Karn, New, New Phyrexia had Karn. Oh, that's true. Right. So we, so we did have seven mana Karn. Right. So Karn we didn't Liberty. know, oh my God, this that's is going to be a colorless planeswalker. What are they going to do? Well, right. my God, it does a lot. And sometimes, for what it's worth, sometimes I'll be playing and they'll play the Ugin and they'll get rid of my board or whatever. I'll untap, kill their Ugin, and then we're just kind of at parody again. So yeah. it's not like There've you been always games, lose. But it, tons of games of Brawl where I've been like, well, can't lose unless they play this one card. And then if they play this one card, I can't win at at all. Like, it's the, one of the swingiest cards of all time. Yeah. They it's, also did, like, a lot of really cool, not, like, magic-related stuff with this Planeswalker. It was one of the first, like major alternate arts that like were huge cost wise also at like the pt at the time they did a an alternate art ugin where he was standing over new york mm. uh, i think which was pretty sweet i have that um but yeah the, the alternate art for this card that came in like the little for fun booster packs or whatever was like right. 300 dollars at the time yeah, yeah. it's still 100 bucks so like the, yeah the, the ugin's fate alternate art ugin is still 100 bucks yeah the there spirit were... dragon yeah, there it were there were twenty six cards there in is, the right there. yeah in the Ugin's Fate pack, and the luckiest of them pulled the Ugin himself. That card Wild. was amazing. All right, so we're we'll move on here to 
Ruben's number two. What you got? Uh, I got another monk, another human monk uh, that has the word monastery in its name. Mm-hmm. My number wow. two. Monastery Swift Spear is my number two card. You hear me? Number two from the block. Um, one red mana gets you a one, two human monk with prowess and haste. So good. That's all it does. So, but, but it's, I mean, card is absurd. It is arguably the best one drop ever printed. Um, which is quite, now I'm not saying it is, I don't think it's but it's, Ragavan, argu- it's arguable. It's good. Well, okay. Ragavan has, is recent. And this is arguably better in the prowess decks, right? Like, this is the card that let you build that archetype in modern. Um, and the damage output from this card is kind of unmatched. The fact that we had Goblin Guide and then um, Burn decks later decided, you know, maybe Monastery Mentor is just better than a 2-2 with haste. Right is wild it is kind of insane because you know if you recall when this was released it was like this is just a bad goblin god why'd you have to make such crappy goblins like wait a minute this card's amazing like it don't take much to make this card just shine i guess is the way to put it like card's terrific it was pretty influential at the time uh it was really annoying uh you know for people got really mad at, at red like mono red more recently in standard this was the time I remember where it was also super, super annoying to people. Uh, I mean, I took this card, I, I took a place out of it to the Pro Tour, that's for sure. Um, this was in, in modern. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's left this huge impact for an uncommon, which seems nuts to me. Uh, isn't this still a couple bucks for sure, right? Yeah. There, I think that regular versions are like three bucks. Three dollars. Yeah. got there's a secret layer version. There's another promo. Time Spot there's, Remastered mm-hmm. version, like the old promo, the old frame Ooh. versions in there. Ooh, the old border. Oh, Ooh. the old border oh, Monastery Swiss Beer is dope. Oh my god, it's sweet. But yeah, Monastery Swiss Beer as a card is. I'm glad it's on your list. It's not on my list, but it definitely deserves a spot. I appreciate. This it. was my number six. Nice, as it should be. All right, let's move on, y'all. Turn the corner here to our number one. Ruben, what's number one? Uh, I share a number one. So all three pairs of the three of us shared either a one or a two or a three. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's that's incredible. And I don't don't know. Well, I do know what Evan's number one is because it's going to be my number four. It's true. Um, Do you still have a higher left, Brittany? Well, yeah, number three. It'll be your yeah, number so, four. Okay, it's arguable that we're yep. we're in the same space. Um, I don't know. I feel like this has to be number one, right? Does it? I mean, it what depends. It? So, like, it, so the rating, if we're correct, if Evans number one is was my number three, that's higher. Yeah. Evans is more impactful for the long term, current for the game. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yes. Uh, you know, higher dollar value now, better for, you know, everything. The car, our number one, was number one for the time. It's the it's memorable. Uh, it is, is nothing now, right? So that's like, that's the counterpoint to doing a non standardized list. Mm-hmm. We All yeah. of our lists are different based on what those things mean to us and what is important to us. Right. So I, I think, you know, from. From Evan's perspective, I could definitely see a good argument for my number three being the actual number one. Sure. For sure. But, I mean, I had, as soon as I started making the list, mm-hmm. I put Siege Rhino at number one before I did anything else. Like, that's what I did. Because first. it's amazing. Hey. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Good boy. Oh, oh what He's the excellent... best boy. Amazing. He's the best boy. He would always show up in pairs. Remember that? That's right. Siege Rhino would always so show many. up in pairs. Why do you always have two of them? I don't know. I mean, I always had like four. Yeah, but three, three or four anyway, more. Siege Rhino is a colorless, a green, a black, and a white for a creature rhino. Four five with trample that when it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses three life and you gain three life. This card ran standard. Um, it absolutely card, did. Even had a minute, a moment in the sun in modern very briefly, but in a world where mid-range, where you have all the mana you could possibly want and mid-range was king, 
Siege Rhino was the king of the mid-range. So so this made mid-range very, very good. The gain life on the card just absolutely stonewalled the aggressive decks, and it itself is super powerful for only four mana, and strong enough to beat the control de decks down before they were able to stabilize. So this deck really did quite a number on the format, and... Uh, it's it's amazing. It was so much fun to play. And every time you play your second or third one, I just hear my opponent like, oh, God, not this again. And like, I'm like, he, he, he. <laughs> I definitely, so much fun. I definitely recognize that there was a point <clears throat> when I would have made my list and I would have put this at number one to start with before we kept moving on. But I also felt like for my list, I wanted to look at the long tail, right? Like, why did mm -hmm. I include Team or Sabretooth or whatever? Right. Like, sure. there was plenty of cool mythics or rares I could have thrown in there. But I wanted to be like, you know what? Like, for the long term, man, these are like some incredibly impactful cards. They change things either now or then or still had a lasting effect. And so Siege Rhino was amazing. Like, it did win its Pro Tour and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know. It was just a card that faded so fast. It was both, it we were sick to death of it, and then it was just gone. Yeah. Which it, is it's unique. sort of like, um, oh man, now, now, now I can't remember it, but there was a, a, a tri-color, oh, poop, never mind, forget what I said, but there's like No, these, I'll be able to identify what you're talking about. What are you doing? It was a Boros card that was like $30. It's just a rare. Uh, this was, oh God. This is the one you could target, the triple red one, triple Boros mana? Yep. Yep. From Gil Triple Boros Mana. Oh, Reckoner? Yes. Yeah. Boros Reckoner. So like, yeah. it's like, I'm so glad you guys are better at the names than I am. It's like, <laughs> we'll play just charade, pictionary thing. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Rares like this just define a format. They're a million dollars and then they just disappear because they don't have the lasting power of like some of these commons and uncommons that we see that have more yeah. like niche uh, interactions with other cards. And uh I, I think I had most of my list similar to yours, Evan, where I wanted these lasting effects. And then this just kind of got like an honorary slot. It just got like a, a I mean, special invite, I guess, to my list. Yeah. It ruled the roost. I mean, there's no doubt about it. See, that was Siege Rhino's format and, you know, you're just living in it or playing in it yeah. or whatever. <laughs> but it was sweet. So for my number one, Ruben's number four, your number three, my process of elimination is one of my favorite cards of the block. And this is also one of the cards that if you were to go back and watch Brad Nelson and I sort of look and talk about this card, I'm just like, whoa, ho, ho, ho. look at the top six. That's a lot of cards for <laughs> a collected card. company. And collected company is a green three generic mana for a rare incident that says, look at the top six cards of your library. Put up to two creature cards with converter mana cost three or less among them on the battlefield. That's, that's mana value these days, mana value three or less. And you can put the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. So for four mana EOT put two creatures on the battlefield, wizards are always going to make creatures. Uh, they're yeah. going to keep making the creatures better, which usually means they're making them cheaper. And as they keep making the better, cheap creatures, this card literally just gets better. It's like, it's it's how Aether Vial ages. It's how any card that just relies, it's how uh, Birthing Pod got just better and better and better. Because, well, they keep making the better creatures. Well, they're going to keep making the cheap ones. And man, Collected Company is a hell of a magic card. It's amazing. Yeah. Card's great. Um, and it really, I mean... Birthing Pod got banned kind of near when Collected Company got printed originally. And so even if the card wasn't going to be good, which very clearly it is, oh. very clearly Collected Company has stood the test of time. People are still making Coco decks in Historic and in Pione in, in Pioneer and Modern. Um, but at the time, people were itching for that kind of green value card. Right. And this one does that. Um, by the numbers, <clears throat> this gives you six mana value for a four mana card. Right. Uh, and it also puts it across two bodies for one card at instant speed. I mean, even just by the numbers, you can tell that if you build your deck around Collected Company, you're going to do something great. It, it doesn't even need to be the same color. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it's not like yeah. two green creatures. It's just two creatures. Um, yeah. The the timing for this, Birthing Pod was banned January 19th, 2015. Dragons of Tarkir came out March 27th, 2015. So two months later, you kind of mm -hmm. had your crazy green creature value thing ready to go. This is a card that's definitely gotten a lot better. Like you were saying, Evan, it's it's aged very well. Due to the way that they wrote it, right? You know, they, 
Wizards has to be very careful when they do certain things and effects that they go, wait a minute, this thing or effect is only going to get more powerful over time. Oops, we got to get rid of Birthing Pod because we can't keep making good creatures if you keep busting them with, with this card. So, And Collective Company is the most played card in Historic, mm-hmm. uh, at least in Best of One Historic. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it did win Worlds in the hands of uh, Brian Brown Dewin nice. uh, in 2016. There you Bant go. Human, the Bant Human's Bant Coco deck. The first time we heard Coco, we're like, what's Coco? And then we got to learn that forever. And that was our top 10 cons block cards. You'll see them on screen right now if you review. Take a look at my list, Nerd Girl's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Nerd Girl. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. We're going to move here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsors, Cardhoard.com and Altersleeves.com, my co-host, MTG Nerd Girl, and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching and listening. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favor, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Or join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.